All right, so as we move on to lateral forces and systems, we're gonna keep taking a look now, not at the origination of the lateral loads, such as uh, uh, what we've been working with before for wind and earthquake, but we're gonna be looking at how we start looking at these elements that resist those lateral loads, how they start to behave, how loads are starting to be assigned to those, and how we start taking a look at how they determine how sufficient they are to resist those lateral loads. And as I said earlier, we're gonna be working with a drift control, which basically is like a form of control like you use for deflection for a beam. Drift is like the corollary for a vertical frame. It's not a safety provision like we would measure stress, but it's a de deformation provision. So it's a much more streamlined, uh, quicker calculation method. So that's expedient for our purposes. We don't have to use the more advanced force and stress calculations that um, well, you might have used before to determine safety. I won't be going through this. We don't need to see that one. So we know that buildings have to be able to resist horizontal forces as well as vertical loads. And taller buildings, the taller the building gets, the lateral forces have to be given more attention. Um, they also provide problem areas where they can lead to large scale collapse as well. And eventually any of the lateral forces we have, they have to be resolved at the foundation. So they're cumulative like a gravity load. The gravity load from the upper loads act downward to the to the foundation. So they are increasing load, increasing load, let's say for a column at every level. Lateral loads also increase as they go down to the lowest level. They'll continue to increase in magnitude to the res resolve by the foundations. Um, I think the kind of the sum of an exception to that in a sense, and that is the uh, base isolation systems and seismic. That's kind of a bit of the reverse. We kind of decouple the building from the from the earth. Therefore, we're, we're removing it from the immediate impact of the um, seismic inertia force. Because horizontal loads come from any direction, they have to be resolved into various components, both perpendicular components and corresponding to the lateral force resisting systems that are placed in perpendicular directions. So in a basic rectangular box, you have two force systems typically at 90 degrees. The maximum ma magnitude of load is assumed to act in each of these directions. An earthquake can action, act in one axis, let's say um, X axis, but it can also act in a Z axis. Vents or shear walls act as vertical cantilevers. They're used to support building gravity loads sometimes, but also can resist lateral loads. A bent consists of vertical trusses or continuous rigid frames. Um, they can be part of an assemblage of columns, horizontal girders, and diagonal bracing. Rigid frames are composed of girders and columns, and so-called wind connections between them will establish continuity. And again, a shear, a shear wall is basically treated as a thin vertical cantilever. So taking a look at these uh, shear wall type systems, um, starting on the left-hand side, we have a vertical wall system, and it's got um, what we call vertical studs back in lecture four, spanning between floor to floor. And the wind is acting along this wall. This is the windward side wall. And a portion of that windward force on the wall goes up to, let's say, the second floor. And the bottom will go down, let's say, in this case, to the foundation. Now, what happens is as the some of them move up to, let's say, the second floor, they act along the horizontal diaphragm at the second floor, and they start to move back. Now, something has to carry that load from the horizontal diaphragm. So in this case, we have all all levels here. This is the roof, this is the second, and this would be the ground condition, but the ground condition immediately gets supported by the foundation at the base. In this case, the building has two shear walls, one on either end, and so the diaphragm force is moving this way, here and here, and it's transmitted back to the vertical shear wall, and the vertical shear wall is gonna carry that back down to the ground. Did we have someone come in? Yes. Did he leave? Yes. Can you see if he's still outside? So the shear wall has to carry... The shear wall still has to carry loads to the ground and eventually 
Michael Shearwalls, terminated at the foundation. Hi, how are you? We don't, we can't seem to get the lights on in here. So if you have any suggestions, we tried flip, I tried flipping that on. Um, that usually turns everything on because it's already synced for this to go on yep. and I'm done. Yeah, during the power surge earlier. Okay. I don't know if that's it or not. And we don't have any uh, campus facilities on ground. Okay. So I, I mean, I can continue to work as I am right now, but I, you know, I do think we need to obviously get something fixed here. Yeah, I'll let the Spanish know and they can try to get on call for us. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. So if we take a look at the other option that we would present with, this could be a moment resisting frame. And back in ID3, people talk to you about portal frames, right? So portal frames are basically these rigid frames. And some of you might recognize them in a steel frame building, lateral loads acting in this direction. Here's what's called the basic portal or bent. And it's a rigid connection typically at the column and the beam at the top. The bottom can be a rigid connection, but it can also be pinned uh, at the column foot. But if they are pinned, they're still stable and they still can resist the load, but the frame is not as stiff as if they were rigid connections. The same would, frame would be stiffer if they're rigid connections. But stability is still provided. Uh, the vertical truss brace frame is the one that you see here. In this case, I'm showing you with two thin rods that are diagonally braced across the, connect, across the, across the, the bay. And in these cases, when you're using thin rods, it's the element that goes into tension that does the work. The element that goes into compression is assumed to fail. If you have a thin dowel rod, eighth inch in diameter, like two feet long, you know you don't put much force on it, you can bow it real easy, right? But if you try to pull it, you're not gonna break it. You and I are not strong enough. It's very strong tension, okay? So my point is, it's accepted that the tension element does the work. Now, in any force direction in this configuration of dual diagonals, one of the two must go into tension. Hence, there's always one of the two elements doing work. There's never gonna be a situation where there's both in compression and neither of them are working. Does that make sense? Nor would there be a situation where both are in tension and they're both working. Only one of the two will work. So again, in your portal frame conditions, maybe like lattice type frames, you might've seen some diagonal bracing going on here and here. And this was bracing a roof and this is bracing the wall. And your last case would be a shear wall. These are the most rigid. Your brace frames are the second most rigid and the rigid frame is the third most and meaning it's the most flexible. It has the most def deformation when compared to the three. The shear wall has the least deformation. It's the most stiff, the most rigid of the three. And generally you see them you can see them as monolithic and solid as a structural element unto themselves, but you also see them as an infill wall. In other words, this is the structural framing system, let's just say that's steel, and the wall is infilled within that framework. That's called an infill shear wall. And so as loads are transmitted, they eventually interact. There's a connection between the framework and the shear wall. They are physically linked or physically connected, and the shear wall takes over. And you see the two different arrows here and you see these kind of crack lines forming or suggested here. Essentially, as this element sort of racks, you know, being square and then kind of turning into a rhomboid, you can see in this direction, this axis gets elongated, right? As it goes from square to rhomboid, it gets elongated. That would be the tension side of the diaphragm action for the vertical shear wall. Not good. Why masonry? tends to be a brittle material. It doesn't have a lot of steel reinforcement in it. Same with some unreinforced concrete, it will form cracks. So if I was to, um, I don't know if you can see this, but there is an example of a failure in this Anchorage, Alaska earthquake. And if you're looking, sorry, you probably can't see it dark, but there's right here is a diagonal. You see the diagonal line right there? That's the crack line. So in other words, this oscillated back and forth with the earthquake. And of course, in the oscillation period, one side went into tension, but then when she oscillated to the right, the other side went into tension, and that's the crack pattern. That's the failure case. So once the crack occurs, it's not going to be stable anymore. It's, it has to be replaced. It can't be reliable. 
Lateral forces are also resisted by edge beams. They require strength as well. So you need to have elements along the outer edges. These sometimes are called your collector elements. Those elements have to be there to transmit loads back down to the shear walls and, the, and, and from diaphragms to shear walls. Shear walls, again, inserted between columns, you know, act in this direction, as I said earlier, and they have to be acting in two axes. So, you know, the, the, the earthquake, let's say, could go in this direction. Therefore, these are doing the work. The earthquake could be in this direction. Therefore, the pink ones are doing the work. And if you notice, they're symmetrical. So this is a non-torsion situation, right? We somewhat shouldn't exactly say that. There's a little bit of torsion here. So framing configurations, <laughs> we worked with vertical studs before, right? We said, here's the floor and it's a vertical stud and it transfers load from diaphragm to diaphragm. If you worked with portal frames in ID3, you probably had what were called girts and they were long horizontal elements and they transferred their forces to the next portal frame, not a sure wall, but to a portal frame. So a girt's another method of transferring loads. These are the studs, the other method of transferring loads. So they go vertically and they transfer loads across the top. And so then in this case, the diaphragm is diagonally braced, tension rods across the roof, lightweight building. This is not a, con let's say this was a steel lightweight frame, but there's no concrete on the roof. This is just insulation at that level. It's not going to be very stiff unless you have very thick corrugated metal decking and you have weld points at certain locations that might act as a diaphragm, but not very stiff. So the other approach is to put the diagonal bracing to create stiffness. Probably in your portal frame projects, you might've seen examples in case studies where they have the diaphragm, the diagonals there to stiffen the, the roof. Now you could have a framework again with corrugated metal decking with concrete. The concrete will then provide a diaphragm action. And this would be classified as a rigid diaphragm. We'll talk more about diaphragm classifications later, but this will be able to transfer. This is kind of like a beam on its side, right? So the beam is on its side, shear wall here, a shear wall here, and those are the two support points for the beam on its side. So like pin and roller connection on either side. And the diaphragm movement gets counteracted when it connects back to the shear wall and the shear wall takes a load back to the ground. So here we are portion of our lateral force. Again, portion goes to the ground, but the other portion goes up to the diaphragm at the roof level. And essentially the resistance is your connection back to your shear wall. And this is pulling our forces back down to the ground and stopping and resisting the load. So diaphragm forces are derived from the self weight of the diaphragm and the weight of the elements and components that depend on the diaphragm for lateral support. And this is an earthquake scenario. I would qualify that. Uh, so earthquakes are determined by self-weight, but in wind loads, it's not a self-weight of the diaphragm. It's the pressure forces that are coming off the wall. Any roof, floor, or ceiling can participate in the distribution of lateral forces to vertical elements up to limits of its strength. We generally do not see ceiling elements carrying loads. They're usually meant only for secondary conditions like supporting uh, finishes and mechanical, electrical, things like that. They're usually not meant to transfer loads. So if you take a look here, here is the load condition acting from a wind or an earthquake. Right? This is referred to as the cord and the cord. These are perpendicular to the wind direction. So you remember trusses had the term top cord and bottom cord. This is basically the analogy, cord and cord. In this case, this would be a cord in compression. This would be a cord in tension. And these are called struts. These are parallel to the direction of the force, wind, or seismic. They're on the short axes. A strut is always in compression. A cord will be broken between compression or tension, depending upon windward or leeward side, if it's wind, or the directional move of the earthquake. So, collector elements and lateral frames, as you take a look at details, there are those edge girders. And so, you know, concrete was having, you know, integral pour between a slab and a beam. There it is. Or if it's a flat slab, there's still going to be some heavy duty reinforcement at the edge condition because that's going to be a collector element. It may not look like a beam there, but it's going to function as an edge collector element in the diaphragm. And again, a corrugated metal deck on concrete, but there's an anchor point here. This is called a steel stud. It ties it back to this beam. This is the transfer mechanism as the collector is the W section. 
And in precast, this is this this you know top and bottom piece that's there's exaggerated up and down. This would be an H frame, as they're called in precast. That's your collector element. And if it's a lightweight wood frame, you know, then this this edge element is connected back into the wall element, and this is your this is your cord element on the end. So let's just take an example as a simple sort of residential application. Here's our wind force acting in this direction. And so these are two roof diaphragms. And what's going to carry the load? Well, these windows are not. Everybody follow me. These are glass windows. This is completely unreinforced at this point. Glass will break. This is your shear wall way on the end. So this is the collector element across the top. That's the element that's going to have to carry that and provide the counteracting force to stop the roof from moving. So it's a shear wall on that end condition. In most buildings, at least according to a lot of the standard code recommendations, you tend to see for light frame residential, you tend to see shear walls at corners. It's not that you have to, but you tend to see them to stiffen the frame at those intersections. Obviously this one does not have that because there's a window here. So again, diaphragm elements, span, direction, windward cord, leeward cord, compression, tension, compression, compression in the strut. Turn the system around, put the wind load on this side. Now these flip. This becomes a strut and compression. That becomes a strut and compression. This becomes the leeward cord and tension. This becomes the windward cord and, and compression. And what sort of forces do we have going through these? Well, there's a shear force going through the diaphragm. And so if I take a look at my, my reactions on either side, let's suppose this was my shear wall here or my shear wall here, it's gonna have a reaction force, right? That's gonna be magnitude in kips, right? So 10 kips on the left, uh, you know, 10 kips on the right, right? Well, it's distributed across what? It's distributed across this diaphragm mass and material. That's the width B. My units will now be in kips per linear feet or pounds per linear feet. So I have to make sure that my diaphragm is rated enough to accept that force. And in some cases there are in the codes definitions of construction types for diaphragms and they tell you what it's rated in. So they'll say this two by eight framework for a floor, wood floor with um, structural plywood nailed or fastened together at this increment, this thick, this is rated for so many pounds per linear feet in shear. So some codes will just tell you the rating of those assemblies. Now the other force condition in a sense is related to the cords here and here. So if I take a look at the calculation here, I would find the maximum moment going through this element. So this would be a moment expression. And my moment force divided by the width B from here to here would be an axial load, in this case, in compression on this side, in tension on this side. So my cord has to be rated in tension or compression stress as well. So again, that would be checked. You'd find out is the stress capacity of that cord in compression or tension adequate to carry that force. So you have unit shear, kips or pounds per linear feet, uh, leeward or windward cord, compression or tension in stress values, magnitudes from moment. So wind loading example, just to kind of reiterate again, here we are, we've got this building. It's again, um, 24, sorry, 36 feet tall, second, third floor condition, vertical studs, 80 by 35 feet. Our pressure is 35 PSF. And I'm just gonna make it uniform. I know that it's gonna step up and change in magnitude like your calculations have showed. But just to simplify it, it's just a uniform pressure. So my roof magnitude for the diaphragm would be tributary height of six feet times 35 PSF. It's going to take a load of 210 pounds per linear feet. On my second and third floor, they both have the same tributary height, six feet above and six feet below or 12 feet total. The floors are both 12 feet. So I have 420 pounds per linear feet. And at my roof plan on the upper right, I have the 210 
pounds per linear feet times 80 feet. Now I've got 16.8 kips total acting on that diaphragm. And this is a symmetrically shaped building with two symmetrical shear walls, one on either side of equal stiffness. So half the load goes to the left and half the load goes to the right. And I have 16.8 over two or 8.4 kips each. And now I have a force on that shear wall. And if I know how to calculate the allowable stress in the shear wall or the deflection allowable, the drift allowable in the shear wall, I know if it's adequate or not. That will be the latter step that we'll go through. But I know how to put a force on it. And on the left-hand side, my second and third floor plans are here. And I have the 420 times 80 feet, 33.6 kips. Again, the two equal shear walls of stiffness of axis of symmetry. In the middle, I have 16.8 kips on either side. All right, so base shear to diaphragms per UBC code looks something like this. We kind of touched on this back in lecture 5A. If you remember the one problem where I showed you not just the base shear distribution, but I showed you how the diaphragm load is established from the base shear. This is UBC 1997. It's very similar, if not the same, for, I, for the IBC 2012 and ASCE 2010. It just says FPX, which is my diaphragm load, is F sub T plus the summation of F sub I from I W sub I times WPX. FPX is diaphragm load, WPX gravity load imposed at diaphragm level X. And um, summation of F sub I is the sum of all lateral loads at level X and above. And WI is the sum of all gravity loads at level X and above. And there is an upper and lower bound, so it can't be more than this or less than that. So again, your base shear diaphragm or base shear loads always look like this, right? The taller you get, the higher the base shear goes, that forces. But diaphragms are the reverse. It's actually through like a second degree order curve, lowest at the upper level. But every time you're adding the effect of the, support, the lower level back onto the system, it becomes largest at the ground. And of course, that force can't be larger than the total base shear, but it will reach that magnitude at the lowest level. So it's cumulative adding up. So going back to the problem that we'd worked for earlier, just taking another look at this from the old UBC code, um, this pretty much looks familiar to you because we did it before, right? You guys remember this one? So here we are, and I, I won't go through this. All the parameters are familiar. We use these parameters based on the uh, seismic zone, Chicago, Illinois, the weights that we had, 158 kips, our Z coefficients, our T factor for um, um, shear, wood shear wall frame was 0 0.02, CV 0.26, 5.5 for a wood shear wall frame. And we ran our numbers and we figured out that our critical load was the 30.9 kips. That was V max. We can't exceed that. And then we went ahead and we did this chart, right? 74, 36, 26, 64, et cetera, to get Vx time H sub X summation value. And then we figured out our percent distribution, right? So 26, 64 divided by 77, 76 says 34% is at roof, 44% at third, and seconds 22%. And the reason this one actually bumps up is because of weight. The roof weighs less than the floor but not always the case. And so we plugged in our values and this is where we got. But if we carry it over to the next level, here we are. So if you notice, our level here for the roof, we've got 10.51, we had 13.6 and we had 6.79. But what's our summation of F sub Y at that level? Well, at the roof level, there's nothing above it, it's 10.51. But at the third floor, what do we have? We have 10.51 plus 13.6, we have 24.11. And what do we have at the second floor? Well, we have 10.5, we have 24.11 plus 6.79, we have 39. WX roof, third and second, our summation, our F sub T plus summation of F sub I divided by W, summation of W out sub I is shown here. And so here's our calculation here. Or 10.51 divided by 74.142. Moving on to the next side, 74 times 0.142 is 10.51 kips. And as we go to our third floor, we got the 20, 
216 kips times 0.112, we have 24.92 kips. And then on the upper level, we had the um, 30.770 kips. But let's go back and check some of our limits. So at the roof min, we got 7.03 kips. That's our minimum capacity. Roof max, 14.06. But we were at 10.51, so we're okay. We can use that value. There's always a max. The, the diaphragms have a maximum limit crap as well. Our third floor min was the 13.49. Our third floor max was 26.94. We calculated 24.19. That was shown here. We're okay. We can use that value. But we run into a problem. We run into a problem at our second floor. Our second floor min's 3401, second floor max 68. We calculated 30.70, so we do have to step up to 3401. So there are cases where the max or min upset kicks in. All right, so now let's take a look at where we are. And now we're going to apportion this to push this back to a shear wall. So here I am at the upper level, right? I've got 10.51 kips. And I'm going to multiply that to 1,000 pounds per kip and divide it by 80 feet. I have a uniform distributed load at from the earthquake event, 131.75 PLF. On my third floor, the 24.19 converted to pounds divided by 80 linear feet. I have a uniform load of 30.302.38 pounds per linear feet. And on my second floor, the 3401 times 1,000 kip divided by 80, 425.13. Now, why do I have to do this? So right now I'm just throwing them across this area here. And in this case, it's, it doesn't seem that it's useful to you because at the end, we know that we have two shear walls on either end and they're of equal stiffness. So half the load will go one way and half the load will go the other way, right? But you don't always have that situation. You might have more complicated frames than that. And until you know, what you're going to be faced with and what kind of diaphragm you have, whether it's a rigid diaphragm, flexible diaphragm, or semi-rigid diaphragm, you don't know where that force is going. So the first step is to, to equate this back to a uniform distributed load. Now, why is it uniform for the earthquake? Because the floor construction is assumed to be the same. In other words, the floor weighs the same throughout its surface area. So therefore, it's uniformly distributed across the surface area. So if we take a look at the shear walls on either end, and we, again, say half the load going one way and the other half going the other way, the 10.51 kips gives us 5.26 kips on one end shear wall at the top, third floor, well, 24.19 or 12.09 kips at the third floor, and at the second floor, 34.01 kips over two, 17.01 kips. What's our maximum shear capacity? Well, it's going to be, what's the shear wall rated down here, right? The shear capacity here is light, right? Only this. It's larger here, but the maximum is here. So the maximum shear check is the 5.26 plus the 1209 plus the 17.01 divided by 35 um, um, feet. I've got 981.57 pounds per linear feet. I'm sorry, I don't think that's correct. That should be kips per linear feet, is that correct? Is that right? I think my units are off. Kips per linear feet. Sorry. Oh, wait a minute, did, did I convert it? I did convert it, sorry. I forgot, I didn't put the thousand in, does that make sense? I, sorry. Right, it's fine. It's fine. I, I should have put the thousand in as a multiplier, but didn't. Uh, loads on structural elements. Um, elements that exist on the building can also carry weights and structural force. So this is a parapet wall that exists above the building, and so we're looking at a uh, the earlier UBC code for a seismic uh, calculation for a wall on a parapet. Standard formula is 4.0, is a constant times CA times IP times WP. Uh, this was the case of the seismic zone 
was 0 0.075. Importance factor was 1.0. It's a non-essential building. C sub A for this construction was 0.19. By having a fixed base, uh, are classified as rigid if their period is less than 0 0.06 seconds and non-rigid if it's greater than 0 0.06 seconds. Our F sub P would be C-A-I-P-W-P, -P, multiplying it out. It um, has a self-weight of 55 PSF. We have 41.8 PSF. That's a seismic force that's acting on that wall. Now, what would you have to be concerned about? Well, the engineers would be concerned about, can it take that load and support condition on the, on the base on the ground? Um, will it fail in bending, for example, that masonry wall? Is it strong enough to take the bending forces acting on it? So let's take a look at this example. Um, we're gonna go back to the IBC coal, but getting it closer to 2000, 2002. This is a um, residential use structure. It's uh, 48 wide by 33.65 to the mean roof height. Uh, occupancy importance factor is one. The roof weights 134 kips, second and third floor 20, 228 and 228. Total loads 591. It's wood stud walls, which, uh, which are shear walls and gravity load bearing an R6.0 for the coefficient for the system. My building period, 0 0.020 because it's a wood frame and mean roof height 33 to the 0.75 factor. It's got a period of 0.28 seconds. My C sub S is SDS over R divided by I sub E. And SDS again is my short period earthquake. And based on the seismic zone it was in, my SDS was point. 1.65 or one uh, two thirds uh, SMS. Sorry, the the SMS is one is 165 percent. 1.65 times two thirds 1.10. SMS is F sub A times SS. F A was for uh, I sub A. F sub A was the soil classification. It was 1.0. So we have 1.65. And if we go back down here, take a look at where we are. Our C sub S, SDS divided by R, I sub E, therefore plugging in our values from above is 0.183, so roughly 18.3%. But we have an upset, it cannot exceed this value. So we're running through our second set of calculations here, and there's somewhat of a change here. This is more of a longer period earthquake condition here, so we've got slightly different values. Um, we're not the same values as we have here. So we're running the second set of calculations and I get point, 0.516. It's great, it's, it's, it's um, I can default back to the 0.183. F sub S is mapped expect, uh, spectral acceleration again based on the seismic zone of the earthquake and F sub, a, F sub A again is our site coefficient. Now there is also a, a caveat in the code. This is in UBC and it's also in the IBCs and ASCE, it says for wood structures, three stories or less, there is a maximum min check. So the min check, the maximum min check is shown here. And so my 0 0.048 was the value for minimum and my value 0.183 is, is this. My max check was over here. That was the last value I checked, my 0.516. So I can still use my initial value 0.183. I'm above the min and I'm below the maximum. Plugging my values in, what's my base shear? Multiplying it times the total weight, it's 108.29 kips. My base shear distribution formula is expressed here again, is this. My T is 0.286 seconds. Uh, anything less than 0.5, there is no multiplier for the base, uh, base shear distribution, K is 1.0. There's no whip effect, in other words, the, building is sufficiently stiff, we have a value of one or less. My WX value for roof is shown here, that's weight, H sub X for height, WX, H sub X here. My total uh, value is 10,984. And now this is my percent broke, breakdown, 45 divided by 10. Now I showed you this as 41.1, it's really 0.411, does that make sense? It's not 44.1, but it's 44.1%. This one would be 
0.94% or 0.394. This one would be 19.5% or 0.915. Multiplying it times these values, we have this, dividing it by these values over here, the 134 to 28.28. I have 0.33. And my FPX is 44.5 now. This did not change, that's my upper value. But as I get down to this level, I have the 44.5 plus the 42.7, and third floor I'm at 87.2. And now I have my 87.2 plus the 21.1 from here, I'm at 108.3, which checks out because 108.3 was my total base shear. So this is just my, it's another way of getting to that FPX value for your, your diaphragm load at the respective levels. So let's take a look at this problem. It's a wood frame building, lateral load acting on it in the short axis. It's got a small parapet above the, the roof level. It's one story, 17 feet. Uh, it's an older code version, UBC. Uh, the roof uh, dead loads 12 PSF. Your CMU walls on the outside. These are my design pressures. C sub E, C sub Q, Q sub S, I sub W. The base wind pressure, 70 miles per hour. Q sub S was 12.6. I sub W, 1.0. It's not a central building. My exposure type B, 0.67 for 20 feet, 0.62 from 0 to 15 feet. My leeward wall conditions are 0.5 and my leeward roof conditions is 0.7 and my we, my windward wall condition uh, windward assuming a flat roof enclosed building was 0.8 so running my numbers here is my windward wall from here to here 0 0.62 0 0.8 12.6 1.0 6.2 psf now i have to switch to the higher wind pressure 0.67 up above from 15 to 20 feet. So I'm at 6.8 PSF. And this is my suction condition on the flat roof. And I know I didn't show you a negative number here, but negative generally means uplift or suction, but I showed you the aerial. So why do I not need a negative number? Because I showed you the direction. Does that make sense? If, it's kind of like a statics problem. If I show you the direction, you know, it implies what directionality means you know, by the force designation of the direction. But you could have put the neg negative number if you wanted to, meaning, leeward, meaning a suction condition. So you'd have 5.9 PSF, it's the roof being sucked off the top. And this would be my wall on the right-hand side. And so it's the 0.67 times 0.5 again. Again, I don't show it's negative, but I do show you the direction to the right, and it's 4.2 PSF. Now, the important point I wanted to mention about this, because we haven't really worked with this before, your diaphragms are affected not just by pushing on the windward side, but by pulling on the leeward side. They're pulled and pushed. So when you do your next quiz, you're going to have to figure both. Your diaphragm loads are gonna come from both. So now let's take a look at our diaphragm load. That's that capital R at the top. But what we did do is we did combine the two loads together and this we just treated it as, as, as if it was acting on the windward wall, but I know it's not. So we added the 6.8 plus the 4.2, positive and negative, and we get 0 0.11 pounds per foot per foot at the top. On the lower level, we get the 6.2 plus 4.2 and that's the 10.4 pounds per pounds per foot pushing to the right, right? And so here we are. And so if we want to find out our reaction here, this is our diaphragm reaction. We have 10.4 multiplied by 15 feet. That's the total magnitude of that pressure force. Where is it at? It's at one half of 15 feet from the ground, 7.5 feet. And what else is there? Now, again, watch the net notation. Clockwise is negative. Clockwise is negative. I know you might have used clockwise positive before. Everybody follow me. They're calling clockwise negative here. We're taking summation of moments here. Clockwise would be negative to them. Does that make sense? Now we get to the upper portion. We have the uh, 11 11 foot per wall. It's acting over five feet. So now that's its total magnitude. But it is 15 
plus 2.5, uh, sorry, uh, 15 um, plus times 17.5, 15 plus 2.5, and so that's to its centroid. And the reaction R is at 17 feet from here to here. Okay. And R is 125.4 pounds per feet of wall. And that's the force that these both positive pressures and leeward pressures from the walls are producing on the diaphragm. So this is what it looks like. Your wall and its roof construction has to take 125.4 PLF. There's reactions on either side. What are the two reactions? Let's say for measuring this going to a shear wall. The shear wall has to pay uh, the two forces divided by, the total force divided by two. Let's say there's two shear walls. They're both symmetrical and they're carrying half the load. So that's 7,837.5. And here's my load going to the shear walls. And there we are at the top. Everybody follow me. This is that diaphragm load. And so here we go. Uh, what is our total shear going force going through the diaphragm or going through the shear wall? Well, 7837.5 divided by 66 feet means it's got a unit shear of 119 pounds per foot. So whatever it's made of, it's got to have that capacity or greater. And also it's got an overturning force. So everybody follow me. That force is acting at 17 feet above ground and it's creating an overturning force this way, right? Does that make sense? And so my overturning force would be the... Um, 113, or sorry, 133,240 foot pounds. So, what is resisting that? Well, the wall has a weight, right? And it weighs this much uh, it's 66 pounds per foot, square feet, and 66 pounds per square feet is 66 feet times 20 feet for height means it weighs. 87,120 pounds. Its overturning point will be here. It's considered to be monolithic and solid, not distorting. So essentially it picks it off of the ground on this side and it tips it on the right-hand side. Does that make sense? It doesn't fall apart. It retains its shape is the assumption. So its, resist, its overturning moment was 133, 240 foot pounds, but what's its resisting moment? The resisting moment from this point here in the lower right-hand side is the 87,120 times the center of 66 feet, that's the centroid of the mass, that would be 2,874, 960 foot pounds. So this is greatly exceeding, right, our capacity for overturning. We don't need any special anchorage condition. Its self-weight is enough to keep it on the ground. Does that make sense? And these are just lateral forces normal to the wall, sorry. Um, I think I'll stop for that. You have a lot of homework to do anyway, right? So you probably don't need any more homework. And we have a ways before we stop the next test, right? So. Uh, do, you, do you want me to record your presentations for the video? Sorry. I'm getting these no's. Here's an issue, though. I got to tell you, there's some stuff with student identity on some of these things. That's why you only see me on the recordings. So I have to be careful with that. So if it's okay with you, I'll just not, I'm not going to record you, okay? Let me see where you are.